This is episode three of the Wilderness Local Podcast. On this episode, I talk with Waste Dog about traditional archery, killing a bull at an arrow's length in this coming season. This podcast is brought to you by Just Shooting Arrows, DC's premier archery shop. Is your alarm going to go off for bedtime this time? Oh, probably. Yeah, it's actually. Oh, dude. I know, two in a row. <laughs> bedtime. Are you recording now or what? Yeah, that's how you do it. You trick people into having a normal conversation so it doesn't start off all like, like just weird. Su- yeah, super clunky. <laughs> but it's weird because we talk on the we talk on the phone like every single day, and then. <laughs> When you try to do one of these, it's kind of awkward. But. I don't know. I used to do podcasts with my old business all the time. And uh, people would have you on there and they'd be like, okay, this is what we're going to talk about. And they're like, you have a conversation about the conversation before you do it. And you're like, this is just weird, man. Let's just, let's be normal. Yeah. Let's just shoot it. Shoot the shit. Yeah, that's right. No, well, that's awesome. I think Chad's going to do good. Yeah, with the stick, eh? He's one of the he's one of them guys. He's kind of just a freaking natural, right? Yeah, for sure. It's like that's what I said to him too. I was like, "Look, I'm hesitant to tell you to change anything because you're like you're almost busting busting knocks off the arrows, but uh, you have some stuff you need to to deal with." Like, yeah, like I just see like he was like he was just death gripping his bow and yeah. <laughs> just get him to loosen up his torque a little bit and then i'm like just work on your release and your bow hand and forget the rest and the and then if you get the, the your foundation down the rest will come that's like, awesome you want to you want to consistently grab your bow hand too right because if you're steady grabbing your bow different every single time yeah you're gonna get a different shot every single time you're gonna have arrows winging all over the place like a year or two ago um I had this grip on a Matthews that I was shooting that kind of like pinched my hand funny. And I would like adjust my hand every time I shot it. It would always end up in the same spot, but like, you know how you double tap your nose or like bring it down. Mm -hmm. Like you tap your, I think you tap your nose twice. That's part of your like sequence. I tap my head twice on the string. I I don't, you know what, man, I don't know why I do that. And I've, I, I do that every single shot. I bring my head when my head comes down to the string. <laughs> my head taps the string twice. Watching you shoot, I noticed it, and then I was watching that video of you shooting that bear, and you do it. I was like, he does it every time he draws the bow back. Tap my head on the string twice. I don't know why. <laughs> I just started like that's one of the things I do. I yeah. draw anchor, tap my head on the string twice, and then start pulling. Yeah, those PSCs that I was shooting last year, they have like a groove machined in the front of the grip. And like, I would always just set my ring finger in it and like, you know, drop my hand like in that, in that line that you're supposed to, and just had my, my ring finger in there and it was deadly. Yeah. Unless we're in Alberta and then I'm just, just shooting over the back of giant deers and it makes me sick for a year. Oh, that's tough goal, man. Oh, there's, that's a hard go i think this year we'll hit it we're gonna hit it with some decoys like just some some of them like not heads up but what the predator decoys i think that'd be money down there yeah, unless cool. it's super windy then it's like a kite it'll be a kite on your bow but which is perfect just the bow can and I, even if they like i don't think them decoys will fool a deer but i think it would buy you enough time to just like settle in your shots so you're not rushing it because you're like when you stand up in the wide open and they're staring at you you got like one one thousand two one thousand then they're blowing that that second stock that we did the first stock that we did on the big deer right not mm-hmm. not the night that i did like the four kilometer sprint in the negative 20 and then came back and like you guys are like you're gonna get pneumonia but not that night yeah. the 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 first real stock that we did when we popped up actually we got close and you ranged and you're like 83 yards i'm like can we get closer <laughs> no no dude there's no way so, no, so here's a here's a tech tip for everybody because i am running a leica range finder were you running i don't know yours <laughs> i don't want to say it's terrible <laughs> just some vortex? vortex yeah of course of course yeah no it's not terrible it's whatever but if you if a guy if you're ranging for a guy make sure your 
range finders are synced. <laughs> like before you go, before you go, stand beside each other and range a fence post and make sure you guys are like, because if a Leica and a Vortex, like we were bang on though. We were within a yard. We, because after you're like, man, was it actually that far? And I'm like, well, I think so. And then you're like, so we, we, we had clicked our range finders together. And yeah. I was, you were like a yard short of me. So we were right there. Yeah. That was after the fact though. But that first, mm -hmm. that first real good stock we went on, you're like, dude, we can't get it any closer. Let's go. And like 83 yard shots, a long shot, but that's a shot I make all the time. Yeah. And well, like, that's not, that's a shot. I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest on a whitetail, but with a muley, I think if the, for most mule deer, I think you can go in with that, something like that. But. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, that was cool. And I, I think, like you said, I think the, the decoy would buy us enough time to really like. It, I think it would, I think it, there's guys that get it done without it every year, but I think a guy could do it. I think that, I mean, it's not going to hurt. No, it's not going to hurt. Well, unless it's 70 kilometers an hour blowing steady or something. Yeah. But and then it's like, and then it's just like, a kite. yeah, which is great. Um, so I've been starting all these things. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll back up a bit. I'll tell you kind of what we're doing. We're kind of like focusing on people's stories more than like this whole like, I'm the best hunter in the world thing. We're not doing that. What we're doing, figuring out how people got to where they are. Mm. Hopefully, hopefully getting guys stoked on getting out there and like having deadly experiences, right? So I've been starting all these by saying, who are you? Because we're like, I think we're a few minutes in. Who are you? What do you do? And how did you start hunting? Yeah. Uh, Wacy Arthur. The, the, um, the waste dog. What do I do? Like, what's my job? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or a waste dog. Waste dog. And that name, I, I don't know. I don't know who started calling me that, but it has something to do with killing coyotes. Nice. Because like either that or because I was listening, I listened to a lot of like, you know, 2000s gangster rap with Ice Cube <laughs> and stuff. So, so either it was a rap name or it was a. Yeah, I think speed goats like it too. Definitely. Because we were pumping, we were pumping it in southern Alberta, and the the deer and the speed goats were, were they were digging it. They started turning up. Yeah, but everybody everybody calls me that. I don't know anybody that really calls me by my name anymore. But nice. And then I got started in hunting. I, my whole life has been just hunting and trapping. I don't know if when I got started, when I came out, I just we just we grew up in the bush, so. Just, you, so where are you from let's let's i think everybody for a while is going to be from bc so you, you're albertan yeah albertan grew up in a little town called marathorpe nice and um we grew up along the athabasca river so there's always lots of game around but grew up wolf trapping and uh my dad is a big wolf hunter so that's what i actually cut i actually was trapping and shooting wolves a long time before i was ever hunting nice so that was kind of my that was my that that was my breakout for a long time and, and um and then bow hunting i have to be honest i never got bow hunting until later in life uh like when i was older right and driving and stuff so i never got like uh my buddy cole he started when he was 12 yeah you know, guys like that had a good jump i never i never got that jump i sure wish i would have man so i had to start off a little later than guys so i had a lot of catching up to do but Makes a lot of sense. I'm getting there. Yeah, yeah, you're doing okay. <laughs> um, so your old man's a big time hunter too. So obviously he was your your influence to get going. Yeah, he was. He actually doesn't hunt anymore. He don't. He I don't remember the last time he shot a big. He still he still hunts wolves, but he still he traps, won't hunt right? any big. Yeah, he doesn't hunt any more big game. No, He's just not into it anymore. Yeah, old school. No, just it's just. Uh, it's just gone to man. I hope that doesn't happen to me. It's just like my dad is almost 70 now and, and he's like, uh, it's just like, it's, it's gone. He, he still likes wolves. It's his passion. But other than that, he could care less if he ever shot another deer. Yeah. I, I, I see the photos of him with wolves. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Old school. Man. Old <laughs> That's school. awesome. Taught me everything I need to know about wolves, man. That's it's cool. hard. That's a hard, it's a hard game too. And if you can, if you could catch a wolf, if you can get a wolf to step on a, on a two by two inch square, you can pretty much sneak up on anything. Yeah. But that makes a lot of sense. That's my, 
that's my game. That's where I got started. So, so why don't you uh, give us give us a few of your big game accomplishments? Because like me and you have been buddies for a few years now, and uh, mm-hmm. it seems like every year you you you, you pull off a, a cool trick. So maybe maybe hit it, hit us with a couple of your a uh, couple of your favorite ones, a couple of your favorite big game kills. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've been in. I've always been like just anything I could hunt, but I've been in the, the last handful of years. I've really been hardcore in the moose, so um, more than anything. So that's kind of been my last few years. That's what I've been really into. But yeah, your twenty twenty moose um, story, I think, is probably worth telling. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, yeah, that so uh, in Alberta we have it's we have a general moose season and it ends on the 21st of September I believe it's the 21st and uh you with the moose are just kind of getting rolling like right around that time I've killed a couple bulls now on the 20th mm-hmm. the, like the day before the season ended they have like a rat closure right yeah so they close it so you know peak moose rut's going to be right uh, on October 1st mm-hmm. uh so but that's only draw so if you want to pull a draw and use your points you can pull that draw and then hunt the rut which is it's money if you can hunt the rut but yeah it takes me three to five years to pull a draw so in the meantime i'm always hunting general bulls and last year i was grinding it out man it was hot and dry and uh, there was a lot it was it's public land and so there was lots of guys roaring around i had i was working this one like basin this kind of bull and there was a six man camp to the west of me and like an eight man camp to the east of me. Combat hunting at its finest, right? Oh yeah, man. It was crazy. <laughs> so anyway, I ran into a couple groups of these guys and I kind of asked them, like, I'm working this base and do you guys mind just giving me a few days? And so they, they agreed to whatever, to kind of just give me a few days. So I got, I was just basically just giving her every high spot I could find and just locate and cow call. That's kind of how I locate bulls. I just cow, I do cow balls. And, uh, I forgot, I'm, I got a moose call, but I forgot it at home. So I had, I had an old windshield washer jug in the box of my truck. Nice. So I just cut the ball. I took the lid off and cut the bottom off and that's what I used. And it was like 25 minutes, 30 minutes before last light. And, uh, I cow ball down in this swamp and this bull answered and he just give one and I'm like, okay, boom, it's on. Right. Yeah. So I kind of drop in with them and it's thick. Like you can't even like, I think a rabbit is going to have a hard time going through it. So yeah, I saw, I'm like, well, nuts. yeah. So I'm like, okay, well actually where he died was quite open but where, where I shot him was super thick. And I'm like, well, either I, and he was coming to me fast. Cause after I, like, if I locate with the cow, especially early season like that, I'll just switch right to bull grunts. So I hit him with a few bull grunts and then he came and he came for a fight and we got, uh, so it ended up, he was coming. And I was like, well, I'm going to move in with him. And then I kind of decided against it just cause I didn't know if I, if I started moving to him and it, and it didn't clear up, then I'm making a whole bunch of noise. And I found like with elk, you can get away with noise with moose. Uh, they're kind of touch and go. I've had some big bulls turn out on me and not commit because of me, my a coat scratching on, on limbs and stuff. So I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I'm just going to stay put with this bull and just see what happens. And he's coming and coming and coming. And I, I noticed like, so the winds kind of, I can feel it on the left side of my face. And I'm like, whoa, he's, he's coming, he's angling, he wants to win me and he's going to win me at about 15 yards. And it's so thick. Like I can't, there's not a 15 yard shooting lane. There's not a 15 yard shooting lane. So I'm like, okay. So I just like, it's so thick. I can't even go through it by walking. So I'm like swimming through the alders pretty much. Yeah. And I got my bow kind of in front of me and I'm just kind of like, he's grunting and I'm just like trying to head him off. I'm just holding my wind. Like, just like we're, we're ready. Like, to, he's ready to cut my wind within one or two yards and we end up meeting at like it was it had to have been under two feet so like I, I was pretty much an arrow's length when I drew and I drew I couldn't get the bow up because of the alders so I ended up drawing from pretty much just below my uh like just below my chest line and I shot at 
whatever, 30 inches. <laughs> and I shot and he was head swaying. And when I drew back, I'm like, because I've been charged by bulls before getting that close. I've seen videos when, of it. <laughs> so when, <laughs> when you get a bull that close and their eye and their their eyes, or you can see the white in their eyes and they're rolled back, two things is gonna happen. Either they're gonna snap out of it and they're gonna go the other way, or they're gonna charge you and run you over because they don't really care, right? They want to fight. Yeah. So I'm like, either I'm gonna get run over when I drop the string, or this bull's gonna turn out. <laughs> So I dropped a string at like one yard, under one yard. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. he just, he took two more steps and he, you could see he just stopped and he looked at me and he cut my wind. Two steps, he cut my wind. He was like, oh, that's a dude. He already had a full arrow in him. And I'm trying to knock another arrow and I can't get <laughs> my bow because the brush is so thick. So I yeah. can't get the arrow on my freaking bow. And you should have short, you should have short little bow too, like. Yeah, That's well, that bull, yeah, that bull was like a 60 incher, but anyway, he ends up rolling out, and I'm like, okay, so I'm in heavy grizzly country by myself in the muskeg, and it's it's just getting like last light was a couple minutes after I'd shot him. Yeah, and he, I'm like, okay, well, I phoned a but I phoned Cole, and I'm like, I'm telling yeah. him the story. He's like, what do you think of the shot? What do you think of the shot? And I'm like, ah, oh, it was like the shot was money. But moose kind of don't sometimes like moose are wimps, but they do die hard sometimes. Yeah. So anyway, we left them. I'm like, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to leave them for the night. And um, so Cole came out like 6 a.m. Cole and my other buddy, buddy Scotty. Before and, work. Uh, before work. Yeah. <laughs> so we got the track and, and we ended up uh, getting in on him to where he was. And there was already a, a bear on him bear oh, just wow. found him so we go in we bump this bear off and um the bear had ate like a softball like he just got there like he had put his claws into the into the bull's ribs and was like ripping oh, wow. on the ribs and he didn't really get through the hide but he ripped a bunch of hair off and then he ate about a softball size out of one hind wow. so i got lucky yeah I, there's heavy bears in that country so i got super lucky that we did not lose i did not lose anything on that bull and that bear just kind of hung out the whole time. Yeah. So we just quartered and we had our pack frames. And um, it, that in where it was, it's just swamp and muskeg. So, so we had these freaking quarters on our back. So every step was right to our knees, man. It was like, it yeah. was like trying to pack a moose hind quarter on a, on a trampoline. <laughs> so and the pack out wasn't too bad it was probably under a kilometer but still it was just like at the end of it at the end of it when i had the mantlers on my back and i'm trying to go through the alders cole's behind yeah. me he's got a quarter on his back and i'm like you got to push me man because i can't i can't like pull it through the alders so he's like pushing me as hard as he can <laughs> and he's That's pushing a good friend yeah he's i'm like just push me so he pushed me and by the end of it i was pretty much crawling on my hands and knees to get the heck out of there so it was nasty yeah but that was my that was my 2020 moose so it was um, that's an awesome story man i think i'm gonna have to make the uh that photo of you with the the rack strapped to your pack there coming out that'll have to be the thumbnail for this episode yeah he was a good bull i think he was right at 50 inches or 51 inches so he was my best bull and that's he was awesome. the most intense bull too but like another thing too with that bull man and i've never heard it and i, I talked to a few old boys and they told me they've heard it but most bulls I've called in and killed this. Is, that was my fourth. That was my fourth bull with just a stick bow, but I've killed some bulls with uh, compounds in the past too, but mm -hmm. I've never heard a bull like uh, almost like a whitetail blow. You ever heard a deer blow at you? Like, whew. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so that bull, he did that and he did that three or four times. And some of the old boys I talked to said that was kind of like uh like he's really, he was, I had him like worked right up. So, yeah. but I've never had a bull. I have had bulls just grunt at me, but, and bulls try to run me over, but I've never had a bull do that. So that was kind of interesting too. Like kind of a smart wheeze almost. Yeah. Like he's just blow, he'd blow at me. He would grunt and grunt and blow. And, and another thing I've been doing too, this works really good is I use, uh, I use my recurve limb and that's what I scrape trees with. <laughs> like not, that seems like a, that seems like a not kosher idea. Not hard, but I'll like, I'll just like drag it. <laughs> if you drag your recurve limb, like on some willows, it kind of sounds yeah. like a pan on a moose. So I can get some fire. What's, up. what's the dude's name that makes your bow? Dan, Dan Tolkey? Dan Tolkey. I haven't He's hunted with his bow yet, but 
he's probably not going to be stoked to hear that you're going to rake rake trees with his with his uh with his recurve. My uh my recurves get beat to hell. Like one season with them, man, that's it. Like if they're pretty and they have a nice finish, they don't when I'm done with them after one season. <laughs> uh Lucian who owns the the archery shop that I deal with just shooting arrows he every year he laughs at me because my bows come in and they're just like they're beat to hell they're like Mm -hmm. they're muddy they're scratched up the the string is done by the end of hunting season it's like he's like did you throw this in a pool and then drag it behind a truck like what is this Mm -hmm. why is it rusty like yeah yeah that's like cole too and them guys they're just like our bows are tools man and you try to keep yeah. them. You don't like use them as a walk and stick, but they get beat. I've de- <laughs> they get beat. There, somewhere on the internet, there's a video of me falling down like this super steep pitch in elk country and my bow. I just like full yard sale, just ejected it. Like, I, goodbye. Like, <laughs> I, call, I called in a bull for a coal, coal last year and he shoots yeah. his bull with his compound he's like down in this ditch and I, so i'm pinned down and just because his bull kind of came in pretty fast so i'm down cow calling face down in the ground he shoots his bull and the, i watch the bull tip he gets up he's pretty jacked up he's running to me he's like gonna tell me he killed the bull he gets right to me trips on a limb and drives his <laughs> bow right in the ground the sight and the freaking cam and the, like like bends the quiver i'm like i'm like your bow he's like who freaking cares? <laughs> uh, so, Did you see pretty, that? It's awesome. Man, he made yeah. a brick shot on that bull too. And he was using a fixed blade grim. And yeah. he blew he blew through both front shoulders on that thing with a fixed blade grim oh, reaper. Wow. I was pretty I was pretty I'll, impressed. I'll have to ask him about it on here. So why don't we touch on uh oh it's uh I should probably like start killing that clock because eh? the last episode too it was going off, but <laughs> I can't hear. It. I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, okay, good. Um, I should probably touch on that. You're shooting uh, traditional only. You're sure, like trad a only. Uh, trad only trad life. You're you're a wood bow guy with feathers. Wood bow no with veins. feathers, no veins. Yeah, only I started wooden arrows. <laughs> no no what else you know what man like i was telling you like today we tried to like earlier today we had a little convo but like i started with wood arrows yeah and they were cedar arrows and i and the guy makes them and and whatever and i was shooting a 55 pound longbow and i had an, a wood arrow delaminate on me after release mm. and it whipped the side of my arm and like blew up on the it blew up on the side of my arm my arm welted right up i was like that's it no more yeah. wood for this guy. That was my one and only. But it, like, Man, you, maybe I had a bad batch of arrows. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's just not worth the risk. It's like that whole thing where you see guys that just they're hammering targets with like seventy and eighty pound bows, and they're not bending their arrows on the way back to where they're shooting from. And you're like, just bend it, just bend it. Make I'll sure it's not going to explode the next time you shoot it. I had yeah. a buddy man one time. Yeah, sure. I'm going to go down a little rabbit hole quick. But I had a buddy one time. He had a QAD drop away. And a bow tech and he shot and it, and it sounded funny to me. And I'm like, man, that sounded weird. And his rest was out of time. So he was his, like his pull cord was like not set. Right. So when he shot his arrow actually hit his rest. So I'm like, give me the arrow you shot. Uh-oh. And I grabbed it. And I just went like that and it broke in half. So I was like, yeah, I'm like, man, you guys got to start flexing your arrows. Cause if he next shot, that thing was going to blow up in his hand. Yeah. I mean, I I've, to the point where to the point where like hiking through blacktail hunt country like some of that blacktail country you're taking spills and you know like we'll we'll get you down here here soon we were planning on doing it last year but you'll see it's like it's just thick and nasty kind of like that that moose stuff you were just talking about but it's like on the way into a spot i remember i took a couple good spills and i was like throw throwing an arrow on the string and i just happened to run my hand down the shaft of the arrow and i was like oh what's this little thing i look at the arrow it's just like just broken in in one spot like sure glad i didn't shoot that out of my 75 pound bow Jeez. yeah and like i was talking to a buddy of mine i was telling you today a buddy of mine from oregon there and he's he was talking about getting into wood arrows mm-hmm. and you know i don't know enough about wood to really 
comment, but I know like lots of guys that are trad to shoot wood. And I mean, wood was what, what everybody started with. So I think that if you got, if you knew what you were doing with wood arrows, I think you could pull it off. Mm. But I, I, to yeah. me, I've just been shooting, yeah. like I just shoot carbon arrows. I have good luck with them and they're, they're durable. I run the outsert. Yeah. I feel like if I say what I wanted to say, we would get some hate from, from the trad folks. Yeah. Like the trad community is weird. Like if I, so like technically I'm probably not considered a purist because I shoot carbon arrows, which is fine, but like, Oh, and you listen to like Dr. Dre on the way to the spot. So yeah. Yeah. It's Ted Nugent only. Yeah. (laughs) Everybody just needs to do their own thing. Everybody gets so bent out of shape, you know, but I don't know. Yeah. I like carbon arrows. There's too there's too many upsides for carbon. You know what I mean? What about when AE came up with that trad vein and everybody was all upset? Yeah. Well, like, you know, I mean, it's a good idea. Like, I think it and I think it's the I like the benefits are there for it to shoot it. The gangsters in the game was, you know, Paul Schaefer. And uh, he shot arrest with 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 veins like a long time ago. Like all them guys shot veins, man. Feathers was, I think, just something that everybody used until veins came around. Then everybody started using veins. I personally shoot feathers because I just love a, yeah. a nice shield cut, barred white shield cut, five inch. They look cool. They look they look cool. That's one thing, man. Like uh, out of my, I was telling you today, like I, I my trad arrow is still an axis because I can interchange parts with my compound arrow, right? My knocks and stuff. I don't have to run two different setups and. Uh, they're different arrows, obviously, but um, I mean, I'm running an axis with a trad vein on it, and it doesn't look cool. Yeah, it like it's just a tool. Like it's basically just like I don't know. Like it's not cool. And then you like look at some of these like wicked feathers, and you're like, man, those are like bad. if I was to wear the point where a lot of them guys they'll have the bags over their feathers. I would switch to trad veins 100%. Yeah. Like if I'm in that kind of conditions that I need, I, I got to have a bag over my arrows all the time. I'm not going to. Yeah. Know. Well, I mean like that, that day, the day that I shot over the back of that black tail last year with my stick bow, it was pouring. The, the feathers would have been like non-usable. The back of the arrow would have weighed a ton and they would have been all falling down and everything. Yeah. Right yeah today i was shooting and i was shooting feathers because that's what i have right now because i'm shooting this this new bow that i got off the shelf and uh i took a slow-mo video to see how my form was with this new video and it's like you can just see water coming Mm -hmm. off of the veins yeah yeah like where you live um you know because it rains a lot right so like continuously but this is another point too that i make with uh, cause I've heard guys on, uh, the stick bow chronicles and different podcasts. I heard a guy one time say, well, I don't tune, I don't bear shaft my arrows cause I don't hunt with a bear shaft. And I'm like, well, you know, that's fine. Your arrows, your fat, your fletchings will correct a badly tuned arrow. It's amazing what a set of fletchings will do or feathers. And if you want to do that, but here's the thing, you get some feathers wet and now all of a sudden you got, an arrow, you got an arrow that can't fly. And now you're really hooped. So, like, to me, there's no downside to bear shafting. Like, if you just want to rely on, you want to rely on, you want to rely on your, on your, uh, on your fletchings to correct your arrow. To me, I think that's a waste of time. Like, you got to put in the work. You want your arrow to hit a straight, come be straighten out as soon as possible. You don't want that thing 10 yards down, like freaking tail whipping way left because you're, you know, your spine isn't cr- hopefully you're getting shot opportunities that close too, right? Yeah. So like, but there's no, there's, there's absolutely no downside of setting up a good foundation to build from, right? Like the less work your veins have to do, the better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like if you could put every, especially in the stick bow world, that's the thing I found. I was kind of spoiled when I shot compounds because, you know, you just go to the bow shop and it- like you look on the box, but like, yeah, I need a set of three hundreds. Put some three hundreds. This is back in the day. Back in the day, you buy some slick tricks and some three hundred spine, and be like, they cut them down to an inch in front of your rest, and you just start hammering. You're like, good to go. And we killed a lot of stuff. But like, I look back now, like with this stick bow world, like you gotta, you want your every ounce of energy, man, 
put into that arrow. You don't want your freaking arrow having to correct because it's way out to lunge. So like, I don't like, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, that's, I don't agree with like not tuning your arrows. Like I just think guys are just being plain ignorant. Like if you don't want to tune your arrow, fine. But I yeah. think you're, I think you're missing out on some, on some penetration at the end of the day. Yeah. And just quality of arrow flight when you get that wind and everything else going on the real world, the real world variables that change hunt to hunt, right? The, the cleaner that arrow can fly, the better, I think. And another thing I wanted to switch this year too, cause I run five inch feathers right now and two blades and I was running the day six and I tried them iron wheels, but I might switch to a three blade this year and uh, I might drop down to a three inch feather. Because I mean, if you're, that's a lot of drag to have a five inch. Yeah, that RMS three blade looks really cool. Yeah, Aaron was shooting it, I think, and he's had good luck. Three blades make a heck of a hole. I uh, like some two blades. I was rocking this year. Um, like I shot that moose with a day six. I shot a couple bears with day sixes, and I mean, I, I'm just on the fence too. Like if you, if you heart shoot a bear with a two blade mm-hmm. with a bleeder they bleed yeah. like they're going to bleed. Um, but I also shot, I also lung shot a bear was right behind yeah. the shoulder, not heart and uh, no blood. It died. Like it died where I could see it, but there was no blood to hardly to speak of. And, but that's just bears. Bears don't bleed because they're fat. Their, their fat folds up yeah, over the cut. Too. Right. And then, and then they're hide. Like if you shoot a bear, like you've shot bears, if you shoot a bear and you grab the hide mm. after man, you're just red. Cause they're, they're, their uh, fur soaks that stuff up. So, I think a three blade, a three blade, like, and I did, you know, like a three blade, a good three blade would work for you all. I shot that bear with a iron wheel wide and Chad helped me uh, get on the blood trail for it. Cause it did run as usual. It seems that yeah, anyways, um, but hardly any blood out of it. That's that old bear thing, right? Where they don't bleed. Don't bleed. Cause the hide slips over. Yeah. The... Yep. Well, I don't know. So that's my, going to be my go-to. I think this year I'm going to try, I'm going to, Maybe buy some VPAs. Let's try them. Nice. They're a little more reasonably priced. Yeah. I mean, the other day we were talking about um, compound setups for Southern Alberta when we're there this year. And you were like, man, you should throw some mechanicals in there. And I'm like, not a mechanical guy. I, I, I'm i letting the exception define my thinking on, on mechanicals because I had one bad experience with mechanicals. And uh you were like, dude, just do it. Like a muley. And I was like, the bad experience I had was a black tail. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing. Like, um, I don't think on a deer, like I would not run a, I would not run a mechanical on big game. I would run a mechanical on a bear. Yeah. A, a black bear. And I would run a mechanical on mule deer or white tail yeah. just cause it's, and I, and I freaking hate mechanicals. I, I don't like them. And yeah. I have killed back in the day I've shot, I shot game with NAP kill zones and the old uh, Ulmer edges, man. Mm-hmm. That was my go-to head for a long time was an Ulmer edge. I actually have a spine here with an Ulmer edge wedge in it. I think you sent me house. a photo of it. That's really cool. So like I, I've rock, I've done the expandable game and I think like an expandable can save your butt if you're, uh, you know, a little bit back or whatever, but, and, and for bucking the wind too, like them severs. So like, Rusty Ulmer was the guy who created the Ulmer edge. Yeah. Rusty, um, they kind of had a patent issue with uh, Schwacker. Yep. So I talked to Rusty and I was talking, chatting to him on, online a little bit. And then he said that this was before the Severs came out. And he's like, yeah, we're coming out with a new head. It's going to be sim- similar to the Ulmer edge. And I'm like, oh, gangster. So then he come out with these Severs. By then I'd already went straight to the stick bow that was in 2014 oh you should piss everyone off and run a mechanical out of the- oh yeah i don't know i wouldn't run one out of the stick no yeah that was kind of like the story on the like that was my go-to head and i was like when they come out with them severs i was like man i wish i wish i was still kind of freaking slanging a few of them around at some deer but just to try them out but you have no interest in compound now hey oh no i'll never t- i'll never I'll never touch one ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like, I'm just at a place in my life right now that like, I don't have anything left to really do for my, like, I don't have anything to prove to myself. I just enjoy being outside with people and, and, and holding the wood bow. 
like I really don't could care less if I come home with a, a big game animal. I just and like I like to kill animals and I like freezers full of meat that but at the end of the day I'm just out there having fun. And I actually kind of the reason that I you know, like I hooked up with you cuz I like meeting new people nowadays. I want to hunt with different guys and and just have a good time. Yeah. I just when I was when I was rocking a compound man it was about one thing and that was stacking bodies and and uh you kind of almost lost sight of what was what i was doing but nowadays i'm just enjoying the, i'm just enjoying the ride man I, i'll never i don't think i'll ever grab another compound i've been doing it i don't know how many years that is now 2014 i started that was my first full year with a stick it was in 14 or 15 it's awesome it's just awesome and it was a and I, and I went to for a first couple of years with a long bow to boot. And I did kill a couple of bulls the first year too, <laughs> or the first few years. And yeah, that's crazy. I, uh, I, I love shooting the wood bow recreationally, but every time I carry it into the woods still, I'm just not there. I'm like, oh, this is going to be so bad. Like if I'm going to get a chance at something that I'm really going to regret not killing, I'm going to feel mm -hmm. bad about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You have to be, uh, that's what holds a lot of guys back on just going full wood bow all the time is you just like, you're like, man, I really, I want to, especially new guys, new guys starting out. They're like, well, I want to really experience success and that's fine. And I, I totally agree. If you want to, if you want to get a lot of success for a lot of years here, I would just shoot the compound. And then do some bear hunts or whatever with a stick and just have fun with it. But when you're ready, you'll know. Yeah, It's like one of the stages too, right? Is you, I don't know, for me, like you just, you just come to a point. Like for me, it was, I called in a bull one time and uh, I arrowed him at like four yards and I'd already been shooting a stick bow for a few years, just but playing, but I'd go, I'd hunt with the compound. Mm -hmm. And I shoot this bull at like four or five yards. I'm like, man, I could do this with a wood bull. And that was like the year I was like, okay, I'm done. I sold everything. Pull the rip cord. Pull the rip cord. Just get at her. But <laughs> that's awesome. And it's a lot more work too. Like, there's no line. Like, you got to get close. But when you, when it pays off, it pays off big, man. I love it. So, how long after you made that jump did you make your first stick bow kill? well the first year like i i don't, was hunting with a compound that year and then i'm like okay well i I'd, I'd filled the freezer i shot a bull and shot some other stuff and then i'm like okay, i got a i had a muley doe tag i'm mm -hmm. like okay here we go so i grabbed the stick and i go out and i just i whacked this muley doe yeah. at like 54 <laughs> yards with a stick with a stick bow didn't even have a range finder or nothing i just like yeah put it on her and um then I, and then I stepped it out after I'm like, okay, that was maybe a little bit far. So I got, I got her and that was the, the next year. Then I, I started full-time, full-time. Nice. But uh, I try to get as close as possible. That's fun for me. I love like getting close is addicting. Like you don't even know what you're missing at 60 yards. Right. Yeah. But it's nice. Like I get jealous. Like when we were in Southern Alberta and you're like, and that, and Emily's at 60 and you're, you know, you're going to send one with confidence i can't yeah on a deer yeah. right <laughs> i i touched on it on the pot on the podcast with i think uh it was either with chad or chris we were talking about it but i was like we that that crazy like three hour stock that we did from down in the bottom there up to the top with those four big muleys like we were on them the whole way yeah and then that dude <laughs> So this deer comes, these deer march through this opening, single file, like all relaxed and calm, right? And uh, mm -hmm. Wacy's across from me. I'm almost shooting at Wacy to shoot this deer. And uh, I didn't happen to have a range finder on me. So I was like, oh, this deer's at 60, perfect. Send the arrow and uh, Wacy maintains till this day that this deer jumped the string, which I don't know if you and Chad are being nice to me or what the deal is. No. No, it was straight up like if you try to pitch you in your head, there's this like little bowl, right? And these deer are up top and they're traveling and they're single file. And so me and Ty are just like hustling our butts on the bottom side of these ridge. And we're just going, we got the wind. And we so we end up 
split. I'm on the left side of this bowl because there's these little fingers that come down to where they're feeding, right? All these little fingers. So we were just trying to just stay with them to see what finger they were going to take to feed. So I end up on one side of the finger, Ty ends up on the other. So I get to see the arrow side of the, of his shot. Like I get to see the other side. I'm like, oh, this is going to be sick. I'm like, I'm going to get to see like a, my first pass through it. I'm like 30 yards from this deer. I'm like, this is going to be. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to shoot my friend. <laughs> this is going to suck. <laughs> so anyway, he shoots and the deer just like does a juke and rolls back as soon as you touch the string on. And I, I seen it with ice hundred percent that deer rolled out. And I got another story for you too, quick. Same thing happened to me once before. I seen this huge white tail buck and he, and it was in September. He was full velvet and he's working his way down this fence line. He just come out of bed and he was heading to feed. And he's like, he's going down this fence line and there's bail. So I'm leapfrogging him from bail, round bail to round bail to round bail. And I end up at a round bail. I'm like, he's going to come by me at like 15, 20 yards. And I got a compound. Yeah. And he comes and I'm already at full draw. I'm hidden behind the bale. And he comes and he, as soon as he steps like broadside of me on the bale, he stops and he looks at me. I just settled the pin. And I, as soon as I touched it, he did that 20 yards. He rolled back 20 yards and he rolled out of the way of the arrow at 20 yards. Well, if it, ha- if it happens to you, it makes me feel better. But like those were like, oh, it makes me feel sick. But those are by far the biggest deer I've ever seen. Like ever. Yeah. There's some nice ones down there. Um, <laughs> and like, it's a, they're survivors too. They know how to play the game, right? Like mule deer, I think like they're kind of dumb, but in the way they're not too, like how they bed and, and how they hold up. Like, did you notice some older bucks were always bedded with younger bucks and does? And like the, the kind yeah. of like the middle, the middle, like three-year-old deer were bedded by themselves then big deer know what's up, yeah. right? Like they put themselves right up with the doe there. They, that's it. That'll, that'll save them more times than wind. What about that? What about that last stock that we did? Uh, you were, you were across the base and, and me and you were like, okay, you and Chad go. We're like hustling in there. And we, we were, I don't know what, 40 yards too high. Yeah. Dropped into the wrong bowl, dropped into the wrong bowl to n- n- not, no exaggeration. 30 sets of eyeballs like it's intense like when you get that many deer right um and like it's yeah. hard in them in the prairie too because we're like i'm flagging you in right so we're, it's yeah. it, other than that you got no markers right you're just trying to like look down off these fingers there's no boulders there's no trees you can't pick a spot and like be like well i'm gonna that rock and he's bedded below that it's just like they're bedded in the that all looks the same yeah it's all the same it's just rolling prairie so you end up the hardest part is getting right in the right spot i think but yeah. we were doing okay i think uh this year was a good learning year right so next year we're gonna hit, this year we're gonna hit it hard so yeah i think it took us the first like four or five days to really get it dialed in and then the last like two days or day and a half or whatever that we were we, we were in them like every minute of every hour the last couple of days that we were there and uh, i kind of like because the because the age class of the deer there is so extreme for me we were starting to kind of get picky at the end there we're like no no forget these ones let's go kill those big ones and in yeah, retrospect well, hard. that might yeah it's, it's hard, hard to reel in the ego a little bit when you're when you're staring at giant deer. You're like, I want that one, even though that oh, yeah. one's and way more killable. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with shooting a, a mature deer anyway, right? Yeah. But I too like I don't I like it when guys just crank whatever they want. If you want to shoot a spike or give her, I mean, at the end of the day, it's your tag. So I'm down yeah. for whatever yeah. whatever so, a guy wants to do hunting with me i'll never i'll never hold judgment on a on a man for shooting whatever he wants as long as it's legal yeah that's fair yep as long as it's legal for sure um so you're i think you said you have enough points stacked up now to draw i'm your speed go i'm due to pull everything I, I have a lot of tags and i'm way behind on pulling it because i've been doing other things right like my i gotta yeah. pull a muley box ready to be drawn uh, bull elks ready to be drawn uh, archery antelopes ready to be drawn trophy like rifle antelopes ready to be drawn like everything i have is piled up and i, I gotta start cleaning this we should kind of 
points up. But. We should kind of maybe uh, explain the point system to all the BC boys on here because nobody will know what you're talking about. Does anybody have that? What do you guys do in BC? It's just lottery. Okay, just so every like, year the odds come out and you just put in and hope for the best. So here in Alberta, what we do is like you can either put in and they call it a triple nine. So you say you want to put in for antelope and you're obviously not going to pull it because I think a uh, rifle antelope is like a 12 right now. So you're not going to yeah, pull so it. So you're, when you put in that for 2019, you're going to get one point. So if you say I'm a 12 on an antelope and I didn't want to pull it. So if I was just to put in without triple nine and just put in just with the zone, then I'm going to pull it. But if I don't, if I'm not ready to pull it, I'll triple nine and then it just stacks one more year on. So then I'm a 13 next year, 14. So you just, you're building your, you're building your points up. Right. So like yeah. everything's like, I think archery, archery goat is a seven right now and rifle antelopes like a 12 and uh, bull elk is up there too for some of their so i got four years till i can uh hunt, hunt goats with the bow yeah yeah <laughs> or five yeah so it's uh it'll good yeah yeah it'll be fun but that's that and then we do have lotto like our our mountain goat is lottery and we had a bison lottery they took that they pulled that us on on us because the numbers were a little lower i think it was the reason those are all um those are all once in a lifetime takes too, right? Like once you draw, you can't draw again, right? I believe so for the buffalo and the goat. Yeah. That's a good segue. So this year, you, me, and Chad are heading up to northern BC to chase goats with our bows. Yep. Archery mountain goat hunt. Goats and hoes. And from what I can understand, I've never been on a goat hunt, but from what I understand, uh, be prepared to get your butt handed to you. <laughs> so... No, I'm ready. Yeah. Let's do it. I'm ready too. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm excited. It'll be fun. Yeah. That'll be your first Northern BC hunt too, right? Yeah. First hunt in BC. So I'm excited. But you've been on, you've been on sheep hunts and stuff, right? Yeah. When I was a kid, my dad, my dad was uh, into sheep hunting and um, he did, uh, he did lots of drop camps for guys. Um, my dad has a horse ranch and he raises mules. So, he has pack strings, so we would pack in. So when I was a kid, I'd wrangle horses for my dad in the mountains, and we'd go in and and pick up sheep and whatever, and do drop camps for guys and stuff like that. So yeah, like I had time in the mountains. It was all horseback, pretty much, right? Like if like I remember as when I was like 12, 13 years old, man, hiking <laughs> hiking ridges in cowboy boots. I just look <laughs> back at that now. I just look back at that now. If I walk downtown with cowboy boots on i'd probably be crippled for a week <laughs> yeah so like, yeah but i was just a kid right we didn't even have hiking boots we were just up there freaking chasing horses around and packing sheep it was good times That's man awesome. and there wasn't many guys hunting back then it was pretty fun that's awesome that's awesome so yeah our our archery goat hunt um we might just be dumb like right out of the gate archery goat let's go yeah i don't know i think like if i can if i can get a spot where i get close on an animal i can kill him i need yeah, to get like for, for sure. me to shoot like no wind with a stick bow i can i could plunk stuff pretty good at 50 but i would yeah, ultimately good... i'd almost like be 20 20 and under would be ideal totally 100 percent. we yeah uh, we also have some pretty good resources with ronnie and then his buddies and we're talking to um bc billy's there too getting getting the inside line on things a bit yeah it's nice that guys are willing to help too and i and i do the same here too man i'll help guys with what i know i don't want to like i don't give my spot like too many good spots away but i'll help guys right i'll point guys yeah. in the right direction there was a guy that uh, phoned me two nights ago he was looking for a spot to hunt wolves and i put him on a spot i'm like man i've been there's an area that i've I've seen wolf tracks and I know, I know there's good, good wolf sign in there right now. And I sent him a, I sent him a pin. So I help, I'll help guys. Nice. I'm not going to give them where, yeah. I'm, where I'm uh, hunting wolves right now, but. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I, I try to help out as much as I can too. I got a, 
I got a few good stories of guys that I've sent sent uh, to places that I've been but don't hunt regularly. Maybe stick your head in here. And they found some success, which always feels really good, right, to uh, be able to help them out. Yeah, no, um, but no, I'm excited, man. It's going to be it's going to be a fun time and like um so i have a mountain hunt when when i was a kid my dad he made his bed rolls right so we had a sleeping bag and a canvas roll we strapped that to a mule that's what we had like we didn't have jet boils and all this stuff like i i've been doing all that for a long time now like how i've been hunting that my style but so there's going to be yeah. some stuff to get figured in my pack for the mountains anyway you know what you really need to figure out for this hunt what's that it's food Cause I, cause I've seen how you act after eating mount, mountain houses for a few days. Oh yeah, man. I could shit through a screen door. I like, <laughs> I'm like, no. So, so anyway, like hardcore talk, my wife and I are like researching. Uh, we bought a food dehydrator and I'm making my own, nice. I'm making my own meals and I'm going to do it like with elk meat and stuff. I'm not. I just can't. My guts are. I got weak guts. I don't know. Uh, I just can't. Eat, I just can't eat mountain houses anymore. I just can't do it. Like some guys can't. Yeah, some guys are... can pound mountain houses for a week straight and be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were you were you were really hurting the the few days there. But I I can I can eat like if I eat one I'm okay. Like I'm not gonna die. But like I gotta man. I just stuff like that. There's just little things I gotta get figured out before we leave. And another thing too, like I've learned over the years, like I used to run a super heavy pack, like chasing elk, man, I'd have a 55 pound pack. And now I've like basically went down to just as light as light as possible. Yeah. You were cruising with that, uh, that cat quiver in Alberta. Yeah. I love it. man. Yeah. I'm like unwilling to make a trip back to the truck to get a, um, to get a different bag to haul meat out with. Yeah. No, and that's true, right? Like, but if I'm with guys that have frames, <laughs> and it's just a deer or something. I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, me and I can Ch- carry quarter. I can carry a deer quarter on my shoulder. Me and Chad were both running full full um, Kafaru setups, and you show up with a fanny pack. I'm like, this is not going to go well when we start shooting stuff. Oh, uh, it'll be all right. Uh, like, and then worst case, see if I got to go back and get my frame. I don't care. No big deal. But yeah, like hindsight, you guys should have your frame with you all the time. Yeah, like a lot of the stuff that we hunt too, it's like you're so far from the truck when you get going. Like my elk spot that I keep trying to convince you to come out here and hunt with me is like we start hunting like, I don't know, 10K, 15K back there sometimes. That's Yeah, that's a different game too. Like when we're chasing elk, we're no, we're no more than four or five miles from the truck, right? So... But when, when I'm elk hunting or big game hunting, I always have a frame with me. Yeah, yeah. Just like deer and deer, I don't really, whatever, not to worry. Yeah, I was, I think in the first episode, I was talking with Chris about just slimming down what I bring and like, it's almost got to the point where I'm not bringing enough stuff. I find myself like, oh, shoot, I need something and I don't have it. But uh, there's a lot of utility in being able to get through the bush fast because you don't have like your entire camp on your back full time you know yeah i agree 100 percent. packs pack weight like some guys too um you know i watched some videos of guys like they're just like running a mummy bag and eating granola bars and just hammering it out and that's fine if you can suffer through that but i can't man I'm, i like to eat <laughs> So I'm kind of stuck. Like I do want to carry, I don't want to carry weight, but I like to, I like few different creature comforts. Like I like a nice bag. I like, you know, pretty decent food. And so I pay the weight tax on some stuff, but. I think it makes sense. I think it really does make sense to pay that, that weight tax for sure on having everything that'll keep you safe and comfortable. Cause if you're comfortable, you can stay out there. Right. I, I yeah. Mean, there, there's there's i mean you know you've hunted with me there's very few scenarios that i'm like not hunting while the sun's up like it's very little that's going to get me off the mountain or, or back to camp yeah like yeah like i think like for you if i was to do your mule deer hunt i would have one meal maybe and like a cooker and some water and just like fold your bag up just have your frame 
right? Or I guess you we had our spotters too and stuff, but yeah, we had a lot of optics with us in Alberta. But so in, another thing that's cool in Alberta that you have on lockdown is whitetails. Yeah, I like I, that's my, that was kind of that's kind of my been my jam for a while. <laughs> uh, so what's what's the biggest whitetail you've killed? Because like Ronnie, my hunting mentor, who has to be one of the next guests that I have on here. When I show Ronnie the photos of your whitetail mounts, he's like the, his jaw hits the floor. So he's, he's an accomplished uh, stone sheep hunter. Yeah. Like I'm kind of like Ronnie too. Like, it's just like, I'm, I just like it. I just, you know, I try not to, I try to keep everything pretty modest. I don't want to be like a guy that beats his chest on inches and stuff, but at the end of the day too, I like killing mature deer, right? I like kill, killing, I like for, I don't know, I'm kind of torn too, like with bull, moose and elk and stuff. I like obviously like to kill big everything, but when it comes to filling the freezer, I like to fill the freezer too. Depends, like the depth of my meat in my freezer dictates my trophy size. That makes sense. Okay, so how big was your, I think it was 2019 whitetail was the one that you just got back, right? Yeah, that so that one was 180 inches or 179 <laughs> and some change. But that was a good deer. Yeah. It's like I, I'm like looking at a like six point white tail, like, hmm, that's a good white tail. Yeah, I had a couple good years. Like I've killed some nice deer in the past, but like 2018, I killed a 170, and in 2019 I killed a that 180. So I ended up I think the total, if you, if you were going to do inches, I think on the total on both, it was like 340 some inches in two years. If you're an inches yeah, guy, but that's crazy. it was good. Like you're not going to have that. You, I, I'm pretty, I feel pretty blessed because I'm not going to have that ever, ever probably again. <laughs> so like there's some nice deer, but you just hard, it's hard to get that deer in that kind of age class structure. But yeah. And two, like I got a buddy, um, in Alberta, his name's Dane. The guy has killed the biggest deer I've ever seen. He's killed some 200s. That's crazy. Um, and I asked him too. He killed, I think he's pretty much, uh, he's got like a, a record book four point. And I asked him like, where do you go from here? Like what's next? And he's like, I just want a deer that's mature five years or older. And so that's kind of like he, him, that's kind of where I put myself to. I just want a mature deer. Even if he's got, you know, garbage head gear, as long as he's an older deer, I'm pretty happy. That's my goal. Honey. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a reasonable goal, right? To kill a mature deer, deer. And some of those deer that you have killed are unreal. So, I mean, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, so with whitetails, it's like a thing, right? Like, you got you to gotta put the time in on them. But that's why I want to start checking. I got to start checking all some more stuff off the list here. I got to this antelope we're doing this mountain goat hunt so whitetails might have to take the back seat here for a few years till we get some stuff done but we'll see how it goes i'm gonna try to take out early in southern alberta this year and then follow you home and try to sit one of your stands uh, yeah man yeah we're gonna get it we'll get after it this one we'll uh we'll get on some deer i got some deer we can chase so did you see on your applications i got you approved for caribou and uh black bear and a couple other species in bc right near where we're hunting too that'd be awesome all of those like because i've never killed a bc i've killed a lot of black bears but i've never killed bc bear so that'd be kind of cool get one of those and obviously caribou would be epic so we'll see but like i just whatever i just want to just do i don't want to try and get too rambunctious we'll see where how this goat thing plays out right see how bad it see how bad i come off the mountain with my tail between my legs so. I don't know if you will, man. I think, I think, uh, like m me and you and Chad, I don't think there's any quit in this. So I might regret saying this, but I think, I think at least one goat is going to die on that trip. At least one. Yeah. So we're coming up on an hour here and, uh, we got to save some stuff for next time. And I think we're going to have you on regularly, right? Yeah. We'll try to do this once a week or something. Hey, maybe next week I'll tag back on and That'd be awesome. I mean, me, me, so everybody knows me and Waze talk like a couple times a week at least. And our conversations are basically this every week. So hopefully you guys are interested in listening to us chat about all things hunting. Yep. 
Thanks for listening to the Wilderness Locals podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our channel and give us a follow on Instagram at Wilderness Locals. 